So one of my big things that I really love speaking on is crossing and wires. And you know, I ask even physicians who've been out for many years, what wires do you use? And they tell me, and I say, why do you use those wires? And the most common answer I get is because that's what I've always used and I'm comfortable with it. Well, I really don't think that's a good reason to choose a wire. I think it's inherent on everyone in this room to understand what creates the characteristics we seek in a wire. Now, why are guide wires so important? Well, we access lesions, we cross lesions, and we facilitate the delivery of interventional devices. And this is really important because if you can't access the lesion, if you can't cross the lesion, and if you can't get your device across the lesion, you cannot interventionally treat the patient. Now, there are a lot of attributes that I seek when using a guide wire. All of these play a role when I'm uh, looking for these, but what create these phenomena? Let's look at those. Well, there are key guide wire components. There's a core diameter, a core material, uh, a core taper grind, a tip style, coils and covers, coatings, and functional diameter. So let's look at these. Let's look at core material. The original core material of wires was surgical stainless steel. And now this has been replaced by and large in most wires with high tensile uh, stainless steel, which um, is not only stronger, but it torques better and it tends to kink less. We also have as a core material, nitinol. Wires like the glide wire have a nitinol core. It doesn't tend to kink. And we have hybrid wires made of stainless steel coupled with nitinol. There's a well that allows us to use these dissimilar materials uh, to import characteristics of both. Now, nitinol is more flexible and it won't kink. That's its advantages. But uh, certainly, we have better columnar support and torque with surgical stainless steel. Next, we have core diameter. Now, in the peripheral space, we use 035, 018, and 014 wires. But why, when, how? Well, there are a lot of things that determine that. The larger the diameter of the wire, the more will be, assuming it's made of the same material, the greater will be its real support and its torque. It's a direct relationship to the radius. In fact, it's related to the fourth power of the radius. And this may enable vessel straightening uh, if we need to come around very tortuous arcs. The smaller diameter of the vessel, the better will be the flexibility and the trackability through a vessel. Now, I hear often people say, well, what really is the difference between an 018 and 014 wire? Since uh, since the uh, columnar support and the torque is related to the fourth power of the radius, we would see that an 18,000th wire, if made of the same construct, would have 2.73 times as much torque or columnar shaft support. Again, widely misunderstood in the field. Now, many of the devices that we use are only compatible with 0.014 wires. So it's important if we're going to use those to understand how do we maximize flexibility, how do we maximize our ability to cross and then ultimately deliver our tools. Next, we have core taper. Many people say, well, Craig, how do you make a wire flexible? Because a wire inherently is not flexible. And the way we do that is we grind it and we create spots within the wire of flexibility by grinding the wire and making a part of the wire of smaller diameter. And so we have the core taper, uh, which, which where we start off, and then we have uh, these core grinds, and then we can add as many tapers as we wish to ultimately import flexibility in the wires at different spots. So we can see that broad, gradual, or very long tapers improve uh, vessel access, and they tend to track better around bends. Abrupt or short tapers create support in much shorter distances. So as you can see in the lower picture, this wire may have great support right at that proximal vessel, even though it's barely in the vessel because it has a short taper and you're on a very strong part of the wire. And there are instances where we may want either of those. 
Now, we can read how many tapers there are in any wire. If ever you look at a guide wire box, you see this chart, and you wonder, what does this mean? Well, what the chart is showing you is this fall in force at each level and stiffness is where you have the grinds. And it gives you an idea of where those grinds are. So in this case, we start to have a taper at somewhere around 18 uh, centimeters from the tip. We have a slow gradual taper, which goes down to the area of 10. And you can see how this falls at each of those levels. Next, we have tip design. Guide wire tip affects steering and durability. Uh, many of the wires that we use in the, in the coronary space are like the ones at the bottom. These are where there's a shaping ribbon and really not a core to tip um, presence as shown on the top. I'm going to really spend most of my time talking about core to tip wires because they're the ones predominantly used in the peripheral space. Why do we use these? Well, there's a better force of transmission because the core wire extends all the way to the very tip of the wire in this case. This allows better steerability. It gives us better tactile feedback because there is no shock absorber in terms of a space. It's ideal for peripheral interventions and it is more durable. Now, some of the new wire technologies have gotten so fancy as between the coils that you see on the outside and these grinds at the tip, they've actually created a micro braid hypo tube that fits between those. It's called Act One technology. And with that, you have better tip retention yet, and again, better steerability. So there is uh, really a profound science involved in making better wires to let us torque even when we're around extraordinarily tortuous bends and vessels above. Now, another thing which is not widely understood, and that is tip penetrance, penetration wire uh, force. Now, what is this really? Well, in basic physics term, it's simply pressure. What is pressure? It's force per unit area. So a guide wire manufacturer can give a wire greater penetrance in two ways. They can either sharpen the tip and make it have less cross-sectional area, or they can impart greater stiffness to the tip. Or you can do both, and that gives us wires with the very highest gram tip penetrance. But it is important to understand that you can modify the amount of tip penetrance by how you use the wire. What do I mean by that? If I simply use a wire, and let's say it's a 30 gram wire, and I'm using just the wire to cross the lesion, I'm not really getting 30 grams of tip penetrance. Why? Because this is measured by industry with uh, a support catheter of some sort, be it a balloon or another support catheter, somewhere between one and two centimeters from the tip of that wire. So, as I bring that support catheter or balloon one to two centimeters from the tip, then I have 30 grams of tip penetrance. But what happens if I then take my support catheter and bring it to within one millimeter of the tip? I actually have more tip penetrance. So it's very important to understand tip penetrance is a number used by industry to give you a relative idea of penetration power. But you affect that as well by the tools you utilize with that guide wire. Very important uh, to understand as you do cases. Now also in constructive wires, we use coils and covers. Why do we use those? They're very important. To start with, guide wire tip coils affect support. They give us improved steering. They give us better tracking as they're more flexible. Um, and and uh, in terms of effect as to how we're using these, uh, we have two different kinds of coils. Those which can be completely round are the traditional coils which are flat. And of course, round coils are going to give us a little bit better torque. 
These, however, do impact the dimension of the wire and by so doing impact tactile feedback. So when we're working on a stenotic lesion, we really want maximum tactile feedback because we don't want a wire going in a place it should not. We want to follow the true lumen. But in a long total occlusion, we need to be able to have a very slippery wire that goes through these long occlusions and does not get hung up. So we utilize different combinations of coils and covers to achieve those ideal numbers that we need for individual cases. Now everyone has heard about jacketed wires. What is a jacketed wire? Well, this is a polymer or a plastic covering, typically hydrophilic uh, polymer coverings, and these simply provide lubricity. These actually give us the lowest coefficient of friction for tips of wires of anything that we can use. This allows for smooth tracking through tortuosity, and in long total occlusions, it stops that wire from getting hung up due to frictional elements. And we can see here a case of a polymer jacket placed on the outside of a wire. This is not to be confused with coatings. A coating is something sprayed to the outside of a vessel. This is a true jacket placed across the wire. Now, by determining what sort of tip coils we use, what sorts of covers we use, what do we do with the shafts of the wires, we can determine how we're going to affect how wires work. Please forgive this. Thanks, I appreciate it. I thought I turned it off. And so we can dial in any amount of tactile feedback or any amount of enhanced lubricity to cross lesions. Finally, we have coatings. And so we have hydrophobic coatings like Teflon. These were the original coatings that were used. These repel water to create a smooth wax-like surface. No actuation with the water is required. These do enhance lubricity and they reduce friction and provide improved device trackability. Importantly, if one wishes to laze, you can laze over uh, hydrophobic coatings, but you really shouldn't over hydrophilic coatings. Now, hydrophilic coatings are the other type. These uh, create water uptake, creating a water-water interface, which gives us the lowest coefficient of friction that we can measure in a, non in a gravitational system. And that is the same coefficient of friction that we see of an ice skate on wet ice. It is extraordinarily low coefficient of friction. These, however, require that you absorb water to become slippery. In fact, if you've ever held a hydrophilic wire that's dry, it's very sticky. Why? It's a mucopolysaccharide. And those are inherently sticky until they absorb water. So we have constant trade-offs when we make wires or use wires. And each of these characteristics may be a characteristic that we want or want to avoid with a wire. So polymer covers and hydrophilic coatings are going to give us the least tactile feedback, but they're going to give us the most frictionless crossing that can be achieved. Wires with no coatings are going to give us great tactile feedback. They're going to make sure we're not crossing anything unless we're absolutely in the true lumen. And we have hybrids in between these, each of which may be how we choose a wire. Now, in addition to this, we must see the wire because at least in today's world, we don't know what to do with a wire unless we see the tip, right? We've got to see the tip to steer it where we're going. And so to do that, we can use platinum, palladium, tungsten, or just simply the stainless steel. But the thickness of the material and the type of material determines how well we see it. And the length of the radio opaque coils also help determine how well we see it. Obviously, platinum is the densest of these and gives us the best imaging. 
Now, in addition to how the wire is made, how you shape it determines how it performs, how you shape it as well as whether you use a support catheter of some sort. So if we want to penetrate a lesion, a total occlusion, we really want to make a, either use a straight wire, but most of the time, a very small angle at the tip at about a 45 degree bend, because this allows us with rotation back and forth to have greater penetrance and to go through a lesion. Now, if there's a lot of tortuosity, we like to add a second bend. This gives us better steerability. And in cases of long total occlusions or densely calcific lesions where we know it's almost impossible to stay true luminal throughout the entire course, we may wish to make a more acute bend allowing us to have a J-tip to go through the lesions and ultimately re-enter. So how do guide wires fail to cross lesions? Well, I say they fail to cross because we fail to understand what's going on. So if the wire tip prolapses at the cap, we can either use a wire of a higher tip gram load, or we can make a very short, sharp angle, or we can add a support catheter, or if each of those doesn't work, we can do all three of those together. Each of those would matter. Secondly, a proximal segment of the wire tip buckles, so the tip penetrates, but then the wire gets hung up. Well, you can use a wire with a higher tip gram load, or you can utilize a hydrophilic coating or sleeve, as that will have less frictional element. Or, again, you can advance a support catheter to give additional columnar support and therefore more penetrance of the wire. Or you could have a tip which enters a lesion, but the wire fails to follow. You can either use a wire with a higher rail support. You can use a lower profile wire. Go from a 035 perhaps to an 018 or an 014. Or you can change to a hydrophilic wire. Or you can bring a support catheter near the tip. And then finally, a wire crosses, but a device fails to cross. Well, when that happens, you can either use a wire with a higher rail support, or you can switch to a lower profile system, or in some cases, you may have to use specialty devices to core out a channel to allow you to get through. So there are many keys to success in selecting um, a guide wire for crossing. Wire escalation is important. Start with a workhorse wire you're comfortable with, but escalate as needed. I see people sometimes wasting an hour with one wire. That is a mistake. Uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work fairly quickly. Change your bend, add your support catheter, but move on if that does not work. Frequent wire exchanges may be necessary. It may be in certain cases that we need one wire for penetrating the cap, another wire for navigating the middle of the lesion, and another for device delivery. You say, that's crazy. Well, that's what we do for coronary CTOs all the time. We wouldn't cross a lesion with a Confianza Pro, which has a great risk of perforating the vessel distally, and leave it as our workhorse wire during the rest of the case, would we? We would exchange for a more supportive wire that's less apt to danger the distal vessel. How you shape the tip matters. And use a support catheter. It may totally change your workhorse wire into a far more useful wire. And in addition to this, access changes all the rules. Why? Because access affects push, torque, reach, support. When I first reported using pedal approach, now almost 20 years ago, people called it crazy. So why would you do that? I said, because you had advised them to have their leg cut off. That's why I did it. And uh, they said I was going to injure the vessel, even though they were going to cut the leg off. Well, this affects all of these things. And pedal access may change our ability to cross because we, we're, uh, we're seeing better. We, we're getting rid of the hibernating portion of the vessel. We're minimizing the use of contrast media. And we're avoiding collaterals. So in conclusion, treating complex lesions is challenging. Wires fail in many ways, as I've shown. 
Familiarity with a multitude of wires can benefit. Understanding wire technical attributes uh, and impact on clinical performance will help the right wire for the right case. And non-wire factors affect wire success. I'm happy to share these slides with any of you if you wish them in the future. Hope to work with you over your careers, help to develop uh, a bunch of advocates for better treating peripheral arterial and venous disease. It's been my pleasure to be here with you this morning.